All right. And then I am going to pass it over to Madison and it's all yours, Madison. All right. Thanks, Mallory. I'm really excited to be here tonight. This is a really different role for me. Um, so like Mallory said, uh, my name is Madison Dorschatz. I'm here with Karen's Educational Alliance. And what that means is I'm a lead student assistant specialist. And my role is based out of Philadelphia and K-12 schools traditionally. I've done a little work with college-aged uh, students, 18 to 21-year-olds, um, working with entire school districts on services on how to prevent substance use disorders from forming with our young people and how to navigate early intervention once that, if it does happen, and how to support families on the in-between, whether it's mental health, substance use, or any other behavioral health concern. Um, so Karen's Educational Alliance, they've been doing this way longer than I have for over 30 years. Like I said, students kindergarten to college. Um, I will say high school, middle school is really my bread and butter. Um, so when I think about some of the trends we're going to talk about tonight, that's kind of what we're going to be talking about what I've seen there. Um, but our programs are available just like this in person, virtually, electronically. Uh, we have a wealth of stuff that maybe you is a little different and sometimes is geared for professionals, but also for parents. Um, and you're probably wondering, who am I and what brought you here? So first of all, I'm not a clinician. Uh, I came here and to Karen with a background in, as a historian, looking at the school to prison pipeline and mass incarceration. And then as an educator working at a recovery high school in Philadelphia, teaching humanities um, to a very mixed group of students there. Um, I went to Westchester, got my master's in transformative education and social change. Um, asked me to define that. It gets a little complicated. It's a really big program, but pretty much what I wanted to understand with that is how can we have community-centered teacher education? And that really brought me to what I do now and looking at community-centered ways to do prevention. Um, when, when I say it's all in the family, that's actually because my mom worked in the treatment world up in the Lehigh Valley, if anyone knows where that is. Um, and I never saw myself working in prevention, early intervention, but I found it through the recovery high school um, I worked at. And I really felt like I wanted to keep working with students who needed more than just the curriculum, traditional like education degrees um, brought. And so I found SAP and student assistance programming, and now I get to sort of bridge the gap between curriculum, traditional teacher, and behavioral health. Um, and the reason I, this topic, and it was something that I'm really interested in, is not only because I have a history degree from Arcadia, and there was a castle, and it was really cool, um, but even though I'm not that long out of school, I'll say a lot in this, I'm a millennial and technically I'm even like a millennial Gen Z cusper, which is kind of freaky to think about. Um, I acknowledge that 10 years is a generation that it feels like a lot when I'm speaking with some of the younger students that I work with. Some of them, they get it. They you know the jokes I have, the, the vines or whatever was popular, but then I'm speaking to some middle school students and I'm like, we are, growing up in vastly different communities. And so that's really what I wanted to think about is how can we understand communities better, who's in those communities as a way to sort of put, wrap our head around the conversations that are gonna continue to happen as our world continues to change. So what to expect tonight? We're gonna talk about community. Just like I said, we're gonna talk about generational experiences. We're gonna talk about social pressures of the time. Some of that might be obvious, but it's gonna be trying to look at it in a different lens. We're gonna look at timelines of drug use and drug policy, uh, trends, misconceptions, and backlash that impacted prevention efforts, um, the status of young America, where are we headed and what do we need to keep in mind as we navigate substance use and mental health? Um, some current debates on what do we do about it? And then what's working in the world of prevention, early intervention that maybe we can take into lives with working with people in recovery, long-term recovery and beyond. So what is community? It's membership, feeling that part of us is invested in the community that we have, that we have a right to belong and feel welcome. It's influence, like we have some sort of say of what happens to us. 
it's integration and fulfillment of needs. I like to think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs of if we don't have one, our basic needs, we can't really become fully realized um, and have desirable social interactions, time to recreate and otherwise, but also shared emotional connection being a part of a shared history of people that get us and that we have interactions that bring worth to our lives. And the reason I wanted to talk about community is thinking about who are we primarily interacting with in our day-to-day? -day? What are their morals and values? What common experiences do they share? And what can we learn about them in order to help them on their journey? And even just pause and think, who am I to offer help? Um, sometimes being the age that I am, I feel like I'm too young to offer information to someone older than me or too young to offer information to someone younger to me. And it's really acknowledging we all have our unique perspectives because of the time and the community we grew up in. And that's something to offer in itself. And another reason I like this definition of community is that substances sometimes offer these same things while often cutting corners. And so to understand community, sometimes understanding the need that someone was trying to fill, whether that was a social interaction, having some sense of membership or ownership, or helping to make an emotional connection. And that brings us to what history teacher me loves is a nice infographic. We're here to talk about generations and what perspectives those have to think about what needs that may need to be filled in those times. So we're going to be mainly focusing on baby boomers, Generation X, millennials, Gen Z. And I also wanted to include Generation Alpha, students we will have in the years to come. And I really love this infographic because it really shows all these things that these generations have lived through. And I think the infographic, the survey question at the bottom, the impact of historical events by generation was really interesting looking at what we rank the highest of what have we seen and how does how how does that carry with us both through the generations and how that changes. Um, and so the pictures on this really cover the big ones, World War II, the moon landing, civil rights movement, Vietnam, JFK assassination, the end of the Cold War, 9-11, um, the wars, the preceding wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, Obama's election, and COVID-19. So it doesn't show up on any of the historical impacts because it happened afterward, but we know that it's going to impact substance use, mental health. There's a loneliness that has come from isolation and that's going to be a big part of this as well. But the colored bars at the top look at cohort reaching adulthood, thinking not only was when someone was born, but when did they reach adulthood? When did they become fully fledged members of society? And what might have been happening to influence how they engaged with that time? And so huge summary here of different social pressures and expectations that come with times. In the 1940s, coming out of the post-war era, we have a changing workforce with women, women not only entering the workforce and then being pulled out of it, increasing interaction between social groups, different races, ethnicities now in the workforce together, um, lots of funding for different people coming home from war to be able to start families. And then we have the 1950s, the white picket fence, housewife, strict gender roles, conformity, the pressure to provide for a family, often with a single uh, single income. And so that's super pressure of needing to provide, needing to be, what is it, a good parent to show up in ways that you're told to, sometimes being very young yourselves, young parents of the time. 1960s, all the social movements, anti-war, civil rights, environmentalism, feminism, really a swing in the pendulum. We had the war that really caused chaos and upheaval. Then we really found conformity in the 50s and now we're swinging back to the counterculture. 
but also Johnson's Great Society, which in a way, uh, Johnson of the 60s tried to free a lot of people from the burden of providing medical and nursing home care for parents. People were suddenly able to buy homes or had some extra income. Um, the Great Society not only accomplished not all of its goals, but it did cut the poverty rate in half. It allowed people to have a greater upward mobility than the time before that. And so there was this great, great shift in sort of potential expectations and maybe social movement between classes or perspective social movement. Um, and then we swing another way to the 1970s where there's economic uncertainty, oil prices are through the roof, we're seeking stability in traditional values or potentially a rejection of them. Some groups holding on to the counterculture or pursuing those social movements, but then come in conflict with traditional values and not feeling accepted after this decade of a, of a lot of acceptance, a lot of youth involvement, a lot of youth voice. And then we get to the 80s where that youth voice, that youth involvement for these social movements really contracts. And we see a continued rise of different conservatism and consumerism of the 80s, Reaganomics, but also a time that we'll talk more about as I go through this of really conservative policy regarding substance use, regarding poverty, um, the war on poverty, the war on crime, and all of that. And then we go to the 90s, which despite living through it and all Google has to offer and the technology increases that exist in the 90s, it was almost a quiet time. There was a quiet prosperity. There wasn't a whole lot of upheaval going on outside of the Cold War ending. And then this great opening up for not only us in the United States, but us around the world and the technology increase that comes with that, the information exchange that comes from that. And then we come to the 2000s, Y2K, the millennia. And then the social pressure here is, uh, I don't know if anyone remembers the stick thin actors and actresses, but a lot of appearance related social pressure, the needing to look and, and act a certain way. But this was also a time where traditional family structure was not as common, um, more divorced families, uh, more acceptance of LGBTQ families and, really rejecting that quiet conformity that we had swung back to in a different way. And so we have a constant pendulum swing from conformity to liberalism that really is mirrored by what our drug policy begins to look like in this country. I have to find where to get my mouse back. There we go. And so before I get into drug policy and what use actually looked like, I wanna pause and think, what have different generations been told regarding substances? What have I been told as uh, a millennium? What has my mom been told? What has my grandmother been told? Were they told anything at all? Certain parts of my family are much more open about communicating it about these different things and other parts of my family, it is, you just don't speak of it. It is a taboo topic. You don't talk about alcohol. You don't talk about drugs. It just doesn't exist. And what does that do? So thinking of different generations, what have they been told regarding substances? What is their, what is their perception of harm for each substance? Because that's going to change a lot thinking of someone who grew up in a time of temperance um, versus legalized uh, cannabis medically or recreationally, the perception of harm for those substances and anything else in between. Um, growing up in an age where heroin you could get at the pharmacy or whiskey is what you gave um, young children who were teething. Drastically different experiences and a willingness to maybe engage in substances as a result. And then what experiences that they had with substances personally or in their community, thinking of different urban areas who've been impacted by waves of opioid use um, or the crack cocaine. What have these trends looked like? Maybe more rural areas, uh, what substances have impacted them there? And even if it wasn't a personal impact, 
what was the impact on resources and ability to access resources and of friends, of extended family members. Um, we want to think about the way we do in the Education Alliance here is we think about risk and protective factors when we talk about prevention now. How can we limit those risk factors like ACEs and strengthen protective factors, strengthen resiliency, promote healthy outcomes, build happy, healthy relationships in order to have healthier communities? What was being done regarding those things or was it being talked about? And so this is a very big summary. Of course, there are trends that come up in different decades, but trends don't speak to lived experience, nor do they get to the sort of dark underbelly that can be substance use. Um, what's being talked about, what's being recorded, um, whose experience is being recorded um, and discussed or accepted or not accepted is a tough thing with history. Um, but for this, I wanted to think of what was one, the picture of the time and what was the priority? What was attracting that attention, knowing that more could be going on in the background? So in the 60s, the traditional image of cannabis, hallucinogens, LSD comes about in this time. Counterculture, of course, that is expanded to include other substances, but what was seen as more socially acceptable in a time of a liberal swing was that cannabis solution wasn't seen as a dark thing, maybe the way it could be seen now. Then we leads us to the 1970s, where we have heroin beginning to take more attention back. Um, heroin was sort of lurking the back um, of the 30s and 40s, came back through the beatnik subculture of the 50s, and sort of took a back seat to the, the free love sort of moment um, where we also had a rise of cocaine and, and increasing cannabis use. Um, and throughout this, we also have increasing potency. Um, cannabis is one we talk a lot about in the Education Alliance at is because it is a rapidly changing substance that appeals to youth. Um, so that's what I'll be referencing sort of throughout this as well. Um, 1980s crack cocaine epidemic takes priority um, as far as even like prevention priority and what was getting in the news it, over alcohol. Um, drastic, dramatic images on the news. And then we have the 90s where this, it was a sort of quiet time of prosperity, but at the same time, methamphetamines, club drugs um, are, are increasing their use. They weren't really showing up quite as much. Um, but it's interesting at this time is uh, cannabis and marijuana use is down. And it's interesting how drastically that was from 1981 to 1989. Um, and then we have this first wave of prescription opioids coming up in this time, which leads us into the 2000s, 2010s, continued rise of heroin, other synthetic or semi-synthetic opioids, along with potentially legal cannabis, depending where you are in the country, whether medically or recreationally. Um, and so I like to point out that cannabis use disorder enters the DSM in 2013, which is really recent despite that substance being along throughout this sort of ride here. Um, and what's sort of complicated is we have contradictory messages, particularly in the 80s or 90s, where we have crack cocaine versus cocaine and uh, there was even a 1981 book that claimed co cocaine wasn't addictive, um, and 66% of Americans said marijuana was a serious problem in schools in their area, and only 35% of Americans saying the same about other hard drugs. So thinking if even of the time, whose attention was where, and were we thinking it, it's in our own backyard. And this I found really, really interesting. Um, this is from the Cycles of American Drug Policy by Dr. David Courtright from the University of North Florida. Um, he put together a timeline of drug policy and sort of categorized it into different goals. So we have um, back in the early 1900s, progressivism, 
Um, this is where we think of temperance, restricting access, um, taking hold of monopolies. And sort of the hard version of this is the prohibition of non-medical drug use, uh, cigarettes and alcohol, um, cannabis being added to this, thinking of Marijuana Tax Act of 1936. Um, and this was a denial of maintenance for non-medical addicts. They did not want to be giving substances to people who didn't have a medical need, um, which really carried on. That time of progressivism gets probably distracted by the war and the post-war, um, young people coming home with shell shock. Um, America wanted to celebrate um, the win in World War II. And it leads us into this time of liberalism where we think of the 60s and 70s. So the sort of liberalism light was ending the drug hysteria. We didn't want to stigmatize users. We want to reform sentencing because back in progressivism, they, they wanted to remove this um, commercialized vice that was made available through the Industrial Revolution. Um, reformers had attacked commerce that stemmed from potentially exploitation of former colonies where some of these substances were coming from. Um, and the money that was coming from this Marijuana Tax Act for importation uh, used fears um, against immigration and Mexican immigrants to sort of fuel that effort. So this liberalism wanted to destigmatize of this, reform some of the sentencing, focus on rehabilitation rather than incarceration. Um, and then this British idea of maintenance for like this hard version of liberalism. Um, for the British, um, they fully believe that addicts should be treated with uh, treated and rehabilitated and not ostracized or forced into the black market. And that's that's the idea where um, maintenance comes in, um, which is really interesting and how it didn't get into the United States at the same time. So still this belief of decriminalization and abstinence not being the goal. Um, you think of it's a wild idea, which makes sense of being a very like liberal idea that wanted a policy that was no longer just zealous of we need to contain it we need to contain it now they wanted it based on reason and based more around uh, potential treatment which is really interesting but then of course the pendulum swings again from liberalism to what we think of as the war on drugs or the drug war um, where in the early 70s and then there was a brief pause um, around Watergate and Jimmy Carter campaigning on decriminalizing cannabis um, and then the later 70s and throughout the 80s and into the 90s, we have this drug war. And this is the, the hard version is those mandatory minimum sentences, automatic, um, three strikes rules, um, zero tolerance policies, sending people to prison for life for, for nonviolent drug offenses, um, asset forfeiture, mass incarceration, intensified, um, I'm just thinking of like the burning, the just whole communities impacted. Um, the soft version was more about um, enforcement and therapeutic communities and discouraging all youthful drug use, trying to get a hold of it. Um, it was seen as this scourge that was gonna take over. Um, the way we looked at juvenile justice in this time period was also really interesting as we said, they, these youth, they can't be tamed. And we also saw more young people being incarcerated or tried as adults in this time period, um, which really leads us to where we are now. Um, most of my um, working memories of ending the drug war. Um, this is the time period where it comes through ending harm reduction, thinking of needle exchanges, medically assisted recovery, decriminalization, lots of sentencing reform and legalizing potential medical cannabis, medical marijuana, marijuana, or even recreational. That's where you get into that hard version of like, what can we, how can we swing the complete opposite way from mass incarceration is legalizing it, taxing it um, for sales that be used for um, early intervention programs for, for school-aged youth, um, abolishing schedule one prohibitions, and also psychoactive drugs, and the research that maybe could come out of that. Um, it's really interesting how we got from the drug war to now. The drug war lasted a really long time. 
and it still has a hold on our communities today. The influence, the memories, um, and even there, even with the time period shifting, there's still a really large population of people who don't want to see that liberal way come back, that they felt safer from that. That control that comes from the Controlled Substances Act, um, that systemized scheduling, provided money for public health approaches, um, and giving some of the resources that were initially for treatment and research in that time of liberalism and moving them towards um, that hard progressivism. Um, Nixon did believe that illicit drug use threatened the nation, nation's future and sort of had to support this shift. Um, in the late 70s, activists were accusing liberals of fostering dependency and permissiveness um, by acknowledging the ongoing drug crisis. Um, in that time, we did see a peak of heroin use, um, but also of cocaine and cannabis. Um, and then by 1979, two thirds of high school seniors have had, who actually had admitted to trying an illicit drug, uh, most often marijuana or cannabis. And so by the time we get to these late seventies, they're thinking not only what is this doing to the adults in our society, what is this doing to the youth? And we have to do something about it. And now the youth of today is going to be pushing back on that legacy. And so this is just interesting to look at that five times increase of male incarceration in the United States, looking from 1970 to 2010. Um, and what's interesting here is in the same time period of the 70s, early 80s, this is where we see uh, anti-drug parent groups. Um, they began forming around 1977. They wanted uh, cannabis re-stigmatized coming out of the 60s. They were the ones pushing for zero tolerance, more resources for law enforcement, youth prevention programs, and that tough love. Uh, this is a period of history where it became the war on everything, the war on poverty, the war on crime, the war on drugs. Everything was sort of debating of who could be the toughest on America's challenges. Um, and this is where we see the time of Nancy Reagan sort of fitting out those parent groups in her Just Say No campaign. Um, in the 80s, we have this moralizing phase under Reagan um, where it's all about the moral state of the country. And then that leads us into the late 80s and 90s where we enter this carceral phase where it continues to grow even as the call for the end of the war on drugs begins we see this carceral phase continue as these sentences build up um, and politicians were running on who could be the toughest on crime, not only thinking, not always thinking of, is it a nonviolent offense? Could this person uh, benefit from treatment? Um, is there a perception of harm to the community, not only of the substance to the user? And so, this legacy of the war on drugs is incarceration. It was the sentence of choice for drug offenses and still is in some ways. Um, by the mid 1990s, three 500 bed prison facilities opened weekly, often in rural America, which gave incentive um, because it offered jobs in communities maybe impacted by uh, decreasing coal or uh, other industries that had left the area. Um, and what this did, this all the money spent to build and maintain these facilities. It diverted funding and resources from education and social programs. Um, we had a growing proportion of nonviolent drug offenders in the system. Um, there was a change in social and economic conditions that we now see thinking of those societal pressures and societal changes of non-traditional families, um, single mothers, single fathers raising children, grandparents raising children that can be linked sometimes to um, experience with the justice system. Um, the saying is one in three black men will be incarcerated in their lifetime, thinking of mass incarceration if these policies don't change. Um, and the interesting thing, thinking of the war on drugs is the availability and potency of these substances has not decreased. Um, 
there was some changing, obviously how we got them has changed. Technology has allowed for a lot of that, um, but they're still there. And so that's what leads us to ending the drug war. A lot of public support to end mass incarceration. It's very expensive. It has broken up a lot of families. Um, there's been a rejection of previous prevention efforts, thinking of the D.A.R.E. program um, that we'll talk more about, but also calls for allowing medically assisted treatment and harm reduction. So this is that swing the opposite way. Um, we want to amend notoriously, uh, notoriously strict sentences, particularly for the difference between crack cocaine versus powder cocaine and the mandatory minimum, minimums associated with that. Um, and then this big focus on ending the overdose epidemic. Um, we know, and as any, I feel like any streaming service has a TV show on this now unveiling big pharma and saying it's not just um, this person who has a substance abuse disorder that society sort of set us up for this and that we were marketed this lie. Um, and so now it's moving away from a government sort of end of thing of a society pushing back saying, no, that's not what's going to fix it. We need to change the way we look at these drugs are marketed and the way they're prescribed to us. Um, but with that ending the overdose epidemic comes a push for harm reduction. Um, what we've noticed with mass incarceration is there's an increase in HIV AIDS, um, without um, supported needle and syringe programs. Um, and then we have the idea of potentially whatever it takes to slow down the overdose, keeping people alive so they can experience treatment um, and not just be pushed to prison. Um, and with that comes the rescheduling of cannabis. Um, that's a big one as way they want to change how long people go way for it. but what we see is that's not always changed in the most equ equitable way um the sentences are always rolled, rolled back part of the past that i and so where are we in prevention in all of this um over the decades it has gone from scare tactics like marijuana caused acne, blindness, sterility um, in the 60s to contradictory messages and glamorization of substances through the rock and roll of the 70s. Um, 70s were a really interesting time when I thought back of this where young people were often given more information about substances and sort of what they did. But this is also the start of scared straight programming um, coming out of New Jersey. And so we had this side-by-side -side glamorization of cocaine and rock stars, but also that sort of other side of it, other side of the pendulum swing of, no, don't do that. This is what's going to happen to you, um, which brings us to the 80s. Um, D.A.R.E., Drug Abuse Resistance Education, launched in 1983. Uh, it sort of goes along with Nancy Reagan's Just Say No. And with uh, police officers, we have a zero tolerance approach entering the classroom physically. I distinctly remember um, the officer who came to my elementary school wearing his belt and his gun and his badge. And it was very much like no nonsense. Um, it was built to educate children on drugs and a non-educational standpoint by telling kids to say no instead of telling them what happens if they take it. Um, it created, in a way, a curiosity and a confidence um, that led to probably some young people participating in risky behavior, which is why D.A.R.E. no longer exists. Um, it was mainly police officers, um, and that's not who a lot of young people respond to. Um, sometimes it could be pretty scary to have this big, intense guy when you're used to your elementary school teacher. Um, and what we know from Scared Straight and D.A.R.E. is scare tactics don't work on youth, particularly those who have already used a substance or know someone who has, because they sort of seen, well, they used it and that didn't happen to them. Well, that can't happen to me. 
And so we have the 1990s, we see this increase in juvenile sentencing, uh, DARE loses funding, and they shift to the Keeping It Real program, which shifts to role-playing refusal skills, which is getting a lot closer to what we do today, teaching young people how to manage difficult situations, evidence-based programs around coping skills, life skills, moving just away from the just say no to what can we do about it? How can you hope cope and what alternatives there are um, in really tough moments? Um, and I like to pause here and think about what were, I, I think of the time I'm thinking, what are parents of the youth I'm working with told about substances? Did they have any prevention program? And as I think about the parents I'm working with, their potential parents, is it wasn't talked about. We had scare tactics, scare tactics and scary stories and the war on drugs, but it was either just say no or potentially seeing someone engage with it. Um, they weren't really talking about the in-between, which led to a lot of misconceptions. And so this was tough to put on here, but um, misconceptions damage credibility of those in this field who want to make a difference and do early intervention work and work in prevention is, I think the classic example is the 1936 movie, Reefer Madness, which is all about terrifying young people into abstinence um, that inevitably probably only made them more curious. Um, and then the now memed, this is your brain on drugs campaign, thinking of the egg cracking in the pan. It's not exactly what happens. And it really focused on only illegal drugs and not thinking how other um prescription drugs could be misused. Um, and it didn't address alcohol because at, at the time, alcohol could be marketed in that way. I think if anytime you turn cable TV on now, there's ads for different pharmaceutical sales. Um, so this was a really limited campaign. But if we're only sharing scare tactics, um, what are we learning about the substance in order to avoid it? And what can we do to protect others who might be engaging? This doesn't teach us anything about how to help someone either. And so we have this bias and this backlash. There's a very racist implementation of mandatory sentencing in the 80s. There's a lack of equity and decriminalization of cannabis and rolling back sentences today. Um, people felt like the war on drugs was a war on their communities and there wasn't I mean there wasn't a chance to really combat that with stop and frisk and feeling like there wasn't another option particularly in communities where treatment wasn't affordable or made available but there's also this distrust in prevention efforts um parents and young people living through misguided prevention efforts of the path and through living through it, knowing and acknowledging the falsehoods that were shared with them. And then we lean on that outdated information, thinking about cannabis in particular, the sort of, it's just a plant, it's natural. Think of the hippies and the videos that came like of Cheech and Chong and the, everything's fine. But in reality, we have a highly addictive substance that is increasing in potency through concentrates um, and even the plant matter itself. Um, and getting that information out there in a way that young people are willing to listen to now is really challenging because they think they have all the information. They know that prevention efforts of the past didn't have all the information, or even if they did, they weren't sharing it. Um, and there's this idea of at least it's not blank. Well, at least it's not cannabis. At least it's not opiates. At least it's not alcohol. Thinking of what that person perception of harm is, and at least it's not the next most harmful thing. But how can we get in front of that when there's a stigma 
that exists as a barrier to accessing support and having conversations around this. And I'm sure a lot of people watching this video have experienced that. Um, and when we have this experience with bias and this backlash, there's a lack of community to replace the substances in people's lives. Thinking of that community in the very beginning of why people might use to begin with. And then how can we build a community that's built on trust, trusting prevention, pre trusting the me messages you're being told. It's really challenging. And so I want to shift a little bit to like, where are we now and where are we going knowing that that's the history that we're dealing with? And so where are we now? We know that Nicotine, particularly through vaping, primes young brains for stimulant use. Uh, THC potency from cannabis plants is way higher than it ever used to be. We have concentrates that could be 45 to 90% pure THC versus the half of 1% that it was back in the 60s. Um, and it's easier to conceal now than ever through vapes that don't present don't present a lot of smell um, or a lot of smoke. And then edibles, again, where we are using concentrates. Um, and even alcohol now is less likely to taste like alcohol. Thinking of seltzers, flavored vodkas, all sorts of different things that are appealing to younger audiences and make it easier for people to engage in binge drinking. Um, and then, of course, we have fentanyl as the opioid of concern, where we know there's an increased risk, but there's a, a lower perception of harm for everything in between. When I work with young people, they go, oh, yeah, 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 I would never do that. But they're willing to accept other risks. And that's where I like to engage in that conversation of why do you think this is less risky than this other? And of course, we know some substances are have potential for more death and overdose, but it doesn't mean we want young people to think one is better than the other. They're all inappropriate for developing brains, um, especially knowing that we have mental health concerns on the rise and then there's the potential to self-medicate. And so we'll get to the mental health concerns thinking of younger generations as we move forward. And so I want to be conscious of thinking of the generations. We have a rise of grandparents as guardians looking at the intersection of the opioid epidemic and children of addiction, um, where there could be potentially outdated perceptions of cannabis and a lower perception of harm because when I was younger, the potency level was lower. Um, and there's a very real priority be being given to opioids and fentanyl that they're actively seeing in their community that maybe have um, given rise to the situation they're in. And let's be real, there's a limited support for guardians at a time when people were planning for retirement and how much time and energy can I put towards cannabis or alcohol or nicotine when I have this much larger concern? Which brings me to what are their concerns of millennials? Um, so I want to shift to the younger generations. What are we seeing and why are we seeing it? So, of course, we have the expansion of social media use. I'm sure my phone's going off probably 10 times throughout the hour we're spending together. The rise of tweeting, text messaging, instant messaging as a way to communicate. Uh, we have a news cycle that is constantly speeding up. We have 24-hour coverage, but the news cycle doesn't even last 24 hours now. We're constantly being fed new information as uh, I get the Apple News notification on my phone as I sit here. We have the first generation to grow up in the age of the internet and sort of that immediate access to communicating with others, but also getting information to fuel debate um, or to find the information that uh, fuels their viewpoint. Um, anyone who's used Google can know if you search there hard enough, you can find the information to back up what you're trying to prove. Um, and then me as a teacher pulls my, can't use everything off of Wikipedia. Um, and so we have this age where we're seeking instant gratification or perhaps an escape from discomfort and unease. Thinking of those um, events from the very beginning of this presentation, looking at 
the discomfort that comes from mass shootings and 9-11 and really complicated um, international politics and being fed that information constantly through your phone that never leaves your side. Um, the rising college costs, the poor job market, these things that follow millennials just as they're reaching adult age, thinking of that time of when are they becoming an adult? And so what, what are the substance use trends here? Um, we were thought, and now Gen Z is thought to be the generation to end smoking. You know, then vaping came up and complicated that plenty. Um, this is a group that came of age with cannabis, potentially legalized medical or recreational cannabis, um, and a much higher potency, so a lot more addictive cannabis. A lot of young people, I will include myself in this, um, I don't really remember a time before medical cannabis was being debated or available somewhere in the country. Um, and this is also the time where we have a rise of prescription opioids, where I grew up being told to trust my doctor and all of a sudden I'm being told that I can't always listen to what they're telling me that the pharmacist might not have all the answers. Um, and we have data that shows that millennials use opioids at a higher rate than baby boomers or Gen X. Um, and it might be linked to increased access to substances with technology, um, being able to find what you're looking for, um, even if you know it's not good for you. And so on the one side, we have uh, people who may have experience with substance use, but I also want to think of who are these people and what are their experiences as they become parents? Um, I'm not a parent myself. I'm part of this unmarried or married later in life, older when I become a parent. Um, but as we think of these parents, there's a trend towards being really open to change. It might be changing ideas around substance use, a high respect of individuality and self-expression, um, more responsive, um, less directorial, approach to activities in family life, um, encouraging children to be themselves and trying new things. So millennial parents might have a lower perception of harm when their child tries a new thing, knowing that, well, that's just how I was in high school. I guess if I had that experience, they should. Which conflicts with the idea, and when Gallup asked, or Pew Research asked, um, what was your number one priority? Um, for a millennial parent was being a good parent and being seen as a good parent. So this trophy generation now sees parenting a, as a competition. Um, and I like to keep that in the back of my mind when I do parent presentations is how can we shift from this idea of individuality and letting children be themselves and trying new things with being a good parent is setting those boundaries and not letting them maybe explore as much as they're telling you they want to. Um, we have young adults being raised to count individuality and self-expression way higher. And so they feel like there's this voice towards maybe um, ending the drug war, um, where it gets, we have these two conflicting sides of things. And so moving from parents, we have, Gen Z. I feel like anytime I Googled generation, I got stuff about Gen Z. So we have collaborative and social, valuing flexibility, authenticity, and non-hierarchical leadership. Thinking of that distrust in the government and people doing prevention work and concerning themselves with inherited issues like equity that might also fuel that idea of rejecting mass incarceration and sustainability and a need for self-care, balance, and what I like to call little treats. Um, why young people might say, I haven't gotten Starbucks all week, it'll be my way to, it's my little treat. There's sort of a little culture on TikTok around little treats. And these digital natives want to reward themselves with that. And they're living in a complicated world coming out of COVID where there's the need for self-care and we're being told to engage in self-care, but self-care is hard. And some young people are more prepared and know healthier ways to do that than others. Uh, when I often give them a list of self-care activities, they look at me like, why would I do that? I would just want to sit on my phone. And I'm like, phone, 
might be taking away some of that energy you have to engage, um, which is why we're seeing Gen Z as the loneliest generation. There's been a spike in reported loneliness from the 80s until today, um, which might correspond with the amount of hours young people are spending or anyone is spending online. Uh, we have this compare and despair trap of social media where we're constantly comparing ourselves to others. At the same time, we have an increase in language and a decrease in stigma around anxiety and depression. Young people are more willing to admit those things. They feel like there's less stigma. They feel like people around them get that. I feel like I hear a lot of self-diagnosing. I have anxiety. I have depression. What leads you to think that is often my next one. But it gets this idea of how frequently are they reporting this loneliness. Uh, we have an increase in online gaming, which leading to online friends, and that takes away that face-to-face -face interaction. Um, at the same time, that phone we're tied to is increasingly reporting rises of violence and traumatic experiences and national disasters that are being reported very casually on social media through Instagram, through TikTok, through stories. Um, you don't have to go over to your TV and intentionally turn on the news um, to be fed this really heavy information. Um, and sometimes it's hard to get away from. And I think young people in particular are really bad about setting that screen time or setting boundaries of when they're going to read that thing, when are they going to engage with that information. And we see that with their stress levels. Um, compared to other generations, Gen Z is least likely to report very good or excellent mental health. Um, you can see there's what they're stressing about compared to adults, um, mass shooting, suicide rates, climate change and global warming, separation and deportation of immigrant and immigrant families and sexual harassment. There's these really big things weighing on their mind, which is why we're seeing maybe use increase in that loneliness around nicotine and cannabis and other drugs. So what can we do? I always like to end with a sort of hopefully more optimistic take of, yes, the world's very challenging and we all have different um, misconceptions and preconceptions and experiences. And it's sometimes hard to separate our experiences from the moment or who we're talking to and trying to put ourselves in the other people's shoes. Um, but at least looking towards young people, because I work in Education Alliance, I hope to have some ideas. So relatability. I think a lot of young people in a lot of, particularly in the United States, we understand that alcohol is dangerous. Um, driving under the influence is known to be dangerous, even though it still happens. Um, but I feel like those rates have gone down. We understand big tobacco and the cigarette companies are not trying to help us. Um, so now we're trying to bridge that gap and understand that vaping is just an extension of that. Um, and that potentially big cannabis as it becomes legal has the potential to transform the media and our understanding the way big tobacco did. Um, and connecting the idea of like a THC poisoning to alcohol poisoning, taking something someone understands, a young person understands, and associating that risk with something else to increase that perception of harm. And pointing out that even though it is legal, it's not FDA approved. Do you know what you're putting in your body? And did it come from someone you trust? Um, if this is a dealer, is this someone you would trust to hold your cup if you were at a party the same way we talk about alcohol? and acknowledging that there is a gap um, and asking young people and the community they're in, what is cannabis or the prescription drug or nicotine trying to fill in the community? So for nicotine, it's vapes are filling the market because cigarette use was low. And now they're marketing to young people to increase that business. But more particularly, it's mental health. We have really long wait lists. Uh, we have the most anxious generations to date. Um, coming of age in a pandemic, um, global anxiety disorder rates are sp spiking and hopefully coming back down. But prepared, reporting mental health is fair or poor, um, but being also more likely to seek treatment. Um, at the same time, they feel like they don't do enough to manage stress. 
So trying to find resources, being the community that talks about and helping to connect people. So we don't have those long wait lists being a barrier to treatment. And so what can that be that in between is social norms campaigns, um, taking away from this idea that everyone's doing it. Um, social norms play on this idea that we underestimate healthy behaviors and overestimate um, unhealthy ones where, for instance, everyone's doing it. No, they're not. It's just because no one's bragging about doing their homework or reading a book. I think I've reached the point in my life where and I, I do now brag about finishing books because I have a, a number I'm trying to get to throughout the year. But pointing out the role of influencers in the media, doing some motivational interviewing with ORs, asking open-ended questions, affirming their experience. I think that's a really, really big thing when we think about for prevention in young people is they think they're right. Anyone who's ever worked with a teenager knows they think they're right. Um, and so in order for them to be willing to hear us and make a change, we have to affirm their strengths and convey respect and engage in some reflective listening and summarize what they're hearing and maybe reflect it back to them in a way says, are you sure you picked up all of that? Where did you get that information from? Can I give you something else? As long with the idea of a little eye intervention, not this big, scary, scared, straight intervention, but picking the right time, planning what you're going to say, sharing your why and offering help along with those setting of limits um, and not expecting miracles, particularly with young people who might not be ready to hear them. And again, getting back to their strengths and respecting their strengths, encouraging unplugged time, like I said, getting away from the constant notifications. Um, and what we hope to continue to do is including youth voice. Um, Karen's Education Alliance is putting together a youth advisory committee, which I'm really hoping can inform some of the work we do going forward. Um, but just keeping those doors open so we don't fall back to the time period where it was misconceptions, where information wasn't coming from a place of health it was coming from a place of fear and keeping that open so we don't fall back into that and so I appreciate everyone logging on today the last few things I have for you is just sharing some of the stuff that you might not know about Karen's Education Alliance we have a podcast for parents and any youth serving professionals called Conversations That Matter there's great topics about grief and about cannabis and about mental health trends. And we also have a video series for parents called Powerful Prevention, Powerful Parenting Prevention in Three. Um, but with that, I'll take any questions if there are any. Um, I know Mallory, you're in charge of that. Thank you, Madison. I am just going to stop recording here.